You're listening to the Podcast Detroit Network. Visit www.podcastdetroit.com for more information. Friends, welcome I mean, I mean, to have, the. Well, you just do you want to just do because I usually let's on three. Oh, okay, one, Ready? two, two three. welcome to. No, no, like you're gonna. You know, I, what? I could just, just just go ahead, just go ahead. All right, all right. Ahead. Hello, friends, <laughs> and welcome back to Storyteller Conclave. This is a show all about helping you be the uh, best tabletop uh, role playing game you can. And whether you're a new storyteller or dungeon master uh, learning the craft or an experienced storyteller looking to take your game to the next level, I am Sarah, and I am back from vacation. You are, and I am Rob, and happy to have you here. Oh, Lord. I'm not even going to say we have updates, because we don't. Uh, We don't really. We've got a Patreon. Yeah. Uh, The the live live show is still... If you're listening to us, good job. You did a great job. You downloaded the app, and you're listening to us live on Podcast Detroit, and they are working diligently. We will use the word diligently because they do not code the things that do the live feed. That's a a word. So, uh, yeah. um, We're going to just... We're going to be honest. This is a return... uh, to podcasting kind (laughs) of episode i'll say so we're gonna start silly and just kind of talk about things a little bit here and then we're gonna get into like something yeah that we kind of discussed so how was your your trip up north uh vacation was actually very nice uh you were camping weren't you yeah we went to the tippy top of the upper peninsula for you um, non-Michiganders, instead of having your mitten up, you turn it sideways, and it's the thumb. <laughs> right, 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 right. We were in the Keweenaw Peninsula, which is about as far north in Michigan as you can possibly get. That's uh, the Marquette or Houghton? Uh, it's a, we were a little bit north of Houghton. Wow, a you really were up north there. Of, yeah, we were not, really Not lower Houghton Lake, upper Houghton city yes is it still city or is it a village uh, on, of houghton on, on the south side of the river is houghton on the north side hancock. is hancock yep yep and then about 20 minutes north of that is calumet yep which is where my and grandmother about grew up 45 minutes north of that is copper harbor yes and so yeah we were we were in calumet yeah my grandmother grew up in calumet oh wow uh, with the, she said it was a really amazing town back like when it was a mining boom town yeah yeah, yeah. uh they had uh they actually would get in like ridiculous acts like imagine if if you lived in a town where, like, you know, you know, uh, Avenged Sevenfold shows up at like your local town, you know, think just because there's a hundred thousand people there working in ridiculous amounts of oh money pouring through. That's the kind of stuff. I mean, they would get these yeah. ridiculous acts up there, and then it just died when the mining died. Your grandma saw Avenged Sevenfold. Yeah, completely. <laughs> actually, it was actually Avenged <laughs> that, Sixfold. That, that, it was that, the previous generation. Right. <laughs> back when they were avenged sixfold that's right that's right and they weren't avenging actually they were instigating so it was instigate sixfold oh so <laughs> yeah this is uh, but there 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 is there's a lot of a lot of history up there uh a lot of mosquitoes oh yeah a lot of, oh. A lot of biting Ooh. flies mm. yeah. um mosquitoes mosquitoes are like being bit by something with a syringe for a face biting flies like getting stabbed mm-hmm. um oh it's it's awful speaking of stab how was the D game i know it was a one shot and and like that was a thing yeah we uh uh so typically the last last couple of years um we loaded up uh D beyond okay. on, on our phones and or tablets right right and we just kind of we, we were up there visiting uh, uh sean's mother oh so okay. we were um we're just kind of camping in their backyard nice which is an expansive wilderness so you know right right when your backyard is 45 acres of woods you exactly know. <laughs> exactly uh but we're we're close enough to uh pick up on her wi-fi signal so Ooh. we basically just sat out at the tent around the campfire and played D. Nice. Uh, and it was uh it was it was pretty good it was pretty good okay. uh, i got to uh I, I since it was just one shot we rolled up fun characters i was playing an 11th level necromancer wizard nice um, w- with a heart, with a heart of gold. Oh, with a did heart you steal gold. that heart of gold? Cut it out yourself? Look, I, she was an ethical necromancer <laughs> who liked to think that, you know, as long as the bodies were long gone and disused, that they were fair game. Ah, so it was a cold cart of gold. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, she only ever used skeletons from long forgotten crypts and stuff like that. And, gotcha. You know, okay. So, okay. you know, I tried. But uh, the, the, the crowning achievement, I think, was getting to, for once in my en- entire gaming career. Oh. My entire gaming career getting to cast Morden Kanan's Faithful Hound. Oh my god. I know. 
<laughs> I know. I I saw that spell on the spell list, and I'm like, I never play wizards. And I, I was looking up things to, to 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 pick up, and I found that spell, and I was like, What does this even do? Like, we all joke about it because of that because of that that famous skit. You oh know? yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But I didn't actually look what that spell does, and it's really cool. Actually. Well, I mean, I'm sure in fifth edition it's a little different, but not like. I mean, I liked how they simplified like Big B uh-huh. stuff, and they 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 took down and they they got back to the roots of what those spells meant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's a combination. It's like an invisible stationary alarm spell mm-hmm. that can attack things that get too close to it. Yeah. It's, it's kind of cool. So it, it's a faithful watchdog. Yeah, it's a faithful. Yeah, watchdog, that's pretty so. badass. So a week off. A week off. How does this feel? Getting uh, back to the mic. I got to be honest with you. Uh, okay. Driving up to the station today was a little weird. Like I had that sort of panic in my, in well, my heart. Well, dinner, like, you kind of didn't like normally we talk about the show or we talk about something we're going to do on the show. And you literally were almost avoiding it like the plague. <laughs> I was like, I, I don't even remember. Do we we do a podcast? Yes. Right? Like, yes. God, yes. It's been so it's been ages. I have no memory of this place, you know. <laughs> so, um. I think it's actually that that exact feeling. Okay. You know, that sort of like coming back from a long time right. away from doing the thing. Yeah. That I think we need to talk about. Okay. So uh, that's I, I I when you brought up the topic originally, I was like, okay, I I, I think she's poking at me because I need to run my D T game. <laughs> well, it was a little bit of that. But um I'll, I'll be honest with you, what, what what kind of solidified this topic in my mind was actually listening it was weird enough, listening to our own show while as, you were up there? as a listener while okay. I was up there. I didn't get to I didn't get to hear it live on uh, on Wednesday night, right, but right, I did right. I did listen to it when it was released on Thursday morning. Uh-huh. Um and uh just popped my head headphones in while we we're eating breakfast and you just say thank you to Fedrin. Yeah, well I I I'm getting there. <laughs> I'm getting there. <laughs> Thank you, first off, Veteran, for filling in for me. <laughs> you did a great that job. Was, it was, it was amazing. Job. Also, on short notice, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, you did an amazing job. Yeah. Uh, I, I was I was a little worried, low key, that I was going to come back and not have a job. So, <laughs> no, like, no, no, no. You know what, Veteran's just going to do this from now on. So. No, but he played your part well. He, he really did. did. He did play he your did. part he well. Did. There were there were several times where he was like, "Well, since I am the the surrogate Sarah today, yes, <laughs> yes." Um, so yeah, returning. Okay. But uh, it was it was actually in listening to that show, okay. and uh, he was talking a bit about you know coming back from a long hiatus. Yeah, definitely. You were talking about coming back from a long hiatus. Yes. And uh, there were a couple other people on our Discord, Techno Lich being one of the main mm-hmm. ones. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, it's uh you know been kind of a t- an ongoing discussion topic with a lot of people, kind of in our in a little community that's sprouted up around the show, of. Oh wow, a lot of us are really kind of dusting off the books mm-hmm. and getting back behind the DM screen for a long time. And there are certain challenges and anxieties that come oh, God, with yeah. that. And um so I I wanted to talk about that a little bit. And maybe mm-hmm. not in the sort of instructional sense that we've typically held with this with the format of this podcast. Are we doing this more in the like therapy sense where we're having a group discussion? Yeah. Well, oh, why don't okay. you Tell me about your character's mother. <laughs> uh, but but no, no, really. Like, because uh, I, I mean, I, I've, you know, I've taken hiatuses from the game. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm currently running one. But th- I, before that, it was like, you know, two, three years. Oh, yeah. Five years. No, no. Like it was it was a while. It was a good, good steady break. Uh, I want to say basically since I've shut down my aberrant game or not my, my your adventure, adventure game. game. Yeah. Yeah. Until I ran aberrant. Right. Then for Knox in a Box and... Uh, and Sean and uh, right, our little Molly right. there. So, uh, you know, we, we've, and, and even before that, then, you know, periods in high school, periods in college and stuff like that were, yeah, there was nothing going on for a couple of years. You're and making, so, I'm doing a quick search on my phone here to see if I can find the last time. Uh, wow. Okay. Uh, I, I'm not sure if this is accurate. Uh, for adventure? 2012? Yeah, I was 30. Oh, wow. I was I was thirty, maybe thirty one. I can tell you because I know exactly which life events of mine made me stop uh, trying to put energy into running a game. Well, uh, and there we go. Yeah. That's I mean we we've talked about the reasons. We well actually I don't think we have talked about the reasons that sometimes stop us. Yeah. But they num- they're numerous. They're numerous. They're numerous. I mean you you it's rare that you. <laughs> I will say this: it is rare that you plan to stop a game. 
like you may have an end mm-hmm. on like a one shot or like a couple shot where you have a closing and it happens like you want it to. Like you get to a close and you're like, yeah, that's what I wanted to do. Finished a story, achievement you know, unlocked. First off, when you do, when you do finally hit that moment as a storyteller where you're like, shit, I just finished this. That, that moment that immediately follows the yeah mm-hmm. is the, do I, do I do another? Right. <laughs> do I have to do another? It's like that, that Netflix series, you know? We're yeah. like, when you, when you hit the end of the series and you're like, oh God, what am I going to do without a, a 15th or 16th se- season of Supernatural to watch, you know? Oh God, yeah. When, like, it, it's funny to say it and I'm, and, and I, I'm going to talk about it a couple of times probably. Um, and it's a funny cartoon, Gravity Falls. Mm hmm. When we got through the second season of that and it, it was the end and it was a defined ending. Mm-hmm. They did a beautiful job on sure. it. It was like, I was hollow. I was like, Oh God, like what? Like it was going to go on to another show. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. I'm not prepared for this. Yeah. <laughs> like, is this going to be better or worse? Right. Or like, like how, how do you feel about those moments? So I think at the end of a gaming session, it's the same way and it could definitely push you into it. Um, I know for me, it was life stuff that mm-hmm. just came along. Like we were. It, for my D&D game, which is coming back around. Mm-hmm. I promise that it will come back around. Uh, not too much longer here. Um, it was literally just we uh, we came to a point in the game and it paused. And I think there was just an extended pause that extended because of circumstances mm-hmm. and just kept extending. Yeah. And then I just couldn't find a good point to come back at it. Yep. But now I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it. I've, I've pulled the materials. I've, I've redone things. I'm starting to do some of the things that I wanted to do as far as preparation. Like I'm putting everything in Scrivener like I wanted to try. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm also finding it's annoying as hell to start something like that. So I'm going to say right now <laughs> as a, as a DM, uh, who's coming back to the fold, don't necessarily restart a game by putting a bunch of data in a system that you're not familiar with cataloging. I, I pulled a book out and just started writing by hand again. Yeah. yeah. So I'll probably end up digitizing most of it just because I need to do it. But uh, yeah, I think I think I might flip between that and between Scrivener and uh, Google Docs again, I think, just to keep it organized. But I did write. So it's good, mm-hmm. like the little things. But I, I guess like, I don't know. Your longest was that probably, right? Was it? What is that like? Oh, I don't. I don't know that that was even my longest though. You had longer before that. Um, because I want to say that I didn't really have a steady gaming group between like college and like definitely a handful of years out of college. But you gamed. I mean, I I might have played in a few games here and there. Did you ever hit people with sticks? Okay, well, look, LARPing, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking more from like the running the game standpoint. I'm with I mean, you on that. Cause the thing is, uh, if we did yeah, that, okay, then so, I had a much longer time. So we, we did, we did, we did, I did some LARPing. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I, I was a player in a handful of games, but player. I think the, the difference between being the player and being the, you know, the, the storyteller is right. vastly different because oh, no, I agree. When, you're, when you're the player, you basically just show up with your character sheet and maybe a miniature and just be like, OK, well, you know, it's, I've kind of got my character goals, but you tell me what's going on. Yeah. You know, the storyteller yeah. has to kind of be God. Mm-hmm. So, um, no, I agree with that statement. Completely. You have to sculpt whole realities by your own whimsy. Mm-hmm. And I know I make <laughs> it sound so grand. <laughs> it does sound so grand, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess it is for the players. It is. And we have to remember that. But, yeah. Um, cause what we do looks totally different from the other side. Cause I being mm-hmm. on the other side of yours by saying that yep. as a storyteller, I laugh, but as saying it as a player, I'm like, yes, yes, you do mm-hmm. that. You're making the world that I play in. So I think the response, sometimes the responsibility hits you a little hard mm-hmm. and then you stumble. And then you don't stand up and you, you kind of just drift away from it. Yeah. And I can say I did that for a long time. I played other people's games, but I didn't run crap. Mm-hmm. And I will say a few times when I did start a long time ago during one of my breaks, I think I had about a, I had about a 10 year, 10, 12 year break, uh, at one point and I put pl- where I played at games. I never ran any games. And when I did run a game, it was crap. I mean, it was total crap. Oh, wow. I didn't know the system that well. Not that the system was that great. What for, system was it? 4.0. Oh. Um, and uh, I was just bad. 
I yeah. had I had a dream. I started doing something, and it was it was terrible. It was absolutely terrible, and it turned me off almost instantaneously. Mm-hmm. Like I shouldn't do this anymore. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm bad. Um, but it wasn't until I think my I think one of the things that turned me, if I'd have to say, um, that worked for me was Seven C. Like when I saw Seven C and I played it, I mm-hmm. didn't run it obviously first. Well, I shouldn't say obviously. I didn't run it first. I played in a guy's game and I saw the system and I liked the way it was being. I liked the style of the play and I'm like, I really need to get this. And then I started looking and realized the books were not easy to find because it was at that point older. It was a few years old, but nobody had touched it. Yeah, and it w- wasn't it already out of print or something. Pretty or? much, yeah, yeah. They stopped printing. AEG stopped printing new books yeah. for it, and so I had to start digging. And I would go to cons and find books, and then friends would find books, and mm-hmm. we eventually pulled it all all the books together. And I think by the end, with without the digital copies, I still have all almost all the books. Cool, which cool, is pretty cool. 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 Yeah. Um, but uh, that's what drove me back into storytelling for me. That's what my first pullback was, and getting me got me back to writing and and finding characters and getting inspiration so let me let me ask you this what was it about 7c that pulled you out of retirement i've always had a very scenic view i i have a cinematographer's eye in my head i will absolutely agree with when i when i look at a scene or i look at and i call them scenes Mm -hmm. uh, when i look at a story and i look at what's going on and i'm looking at the players in my mind and i'm figuring out what's going on i'm watching the bad guys or i'm watching the antagonists literally through the uh, lens of a camera Mm -hmm. i will paint things like a lens through camera especially with 7c i'll talk about literally camera movements and what you're seeing and glints and so you're getting a very uh, cinematic view of things like it's this is a a tv show almost Mm -hmm. and a lot of times in 7c they talk about things in that sense you want to portray it in that sense that literally you're watching Man in the Iron Mask, or you're watching The Three Musketeers, you're watching, you know, Don Juan DeMarco, mm-hmm. or one of those kinds of movies where there's a lot of scenery moving around, and you do get glimpses of the antagonist. At times, you're given scenes that occur from the antagonist point of view, uh, or from a, a scene in them. You know, you see Count Richelieu talking to, you know, a, uh, a dignitary from another land about some secret deal, but you're not sure exactly what's going on there. And then it cuts to some event because while they were standing there talking, you know, uh, uh, you know, one of his henchmen comes in and says, you know, we believe we know where they're at. And well, you know, well, then why, what are you waiting for? Deliver the note. And he leaves. And then the next scene is, the players being delivered the note, mm-hmm. you know, and the scene continues. Right. And it's those kind of things that really endeared me and intrigued me about 7C of saying like, well, how do you play a game where the players are given scenes? They're, they're handed one part and then what, what they move to next is up to them. But then there's other scenes. There's other intrigue. There's other moments. Mm-hmm. And it's always about this heroic vibe that sits behind the whole thing. And coming from fourth edition D and D, yeah, that really kind of spoke to the cinematographer in you. Then very and much it was so. Like you know what, I I need to run this. Yeah, and I I've always had a thing for for cinematography mm-hmm. and for film. Like I'll look at shots that that some cinematographers oh, sure, done, and sure. it will some will make me cry because I know the effort that they went into to to build that shot Mm -hmm. and that's not cgi that's it's literally i took the time to make this beautiful like some of the stuff that okay go does in their freaking videos oh yeah where it's one continuous take there the angles change the camera shifts may go upside down they might be in zero gravity i mean they literally do the most insane stuff Mm -hmm. but i look at that from so many different ways and i'm like that's beautiful that's art on so many levels that fight scene in the first season of daredevil Okay. On Netflix. Yep. Yep. It's like eleven minutes long with yep. no cuts or something like that. Yep. It was just yep. insane. There, there's just a insane. Yeah. Atomic Blonde has a fight sequence that's one continuous camera shot. Oh my god! And I think it's. I, I want to say I'm looking over at uh, Kate, Kate. Kate's nodding it's, emphatically. I want to say it's, right what now. is it like a? It's like a seven minute fight sequence or something. It's really long. It's a, It's at least over five minutes. Yeah. And it's awesome yeah it's it's this epic fight sequence mm-hmm. john wick would cry kind of a thing um uh, from a cinematographer point of view because it's beautiful now granted john wick has had some very long fight sequences oh yeah yeah, in it, yeah but they're moving through an open staircase and through a broken apartments mm-hmm. 
and going up and down stairs oh and God, yeah. there's in its angles and you're getting compassion from characters and wounds and nothing stops. You just watch this whole thing break through and you're like, there should have been a cut in that. And you go back through and there's no cut. possibility. Yeah. It, it feels like that. So um, it was beautiful. It was beautiful to watch stuff like that. And so that's kind of the stuff that draws me to Seventh Sea. And then sometimes when I go into other stories or other systems, I have to take that eye with me and change it a little mm-hmm. because it doesn't fit for everybody. Right, right. No, absolutely. And, and it I doesn't know, fit for all players. That's something you and I have talked a lot about is the difference in our in our own storytelling styles. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I, I like a very more grounded, a very, I, I, I kind of like the gritty realism, but I try not to get too gritty with my realism. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm, I'm constantly trending in that direction. Whereas I think you constantly trend in the more bigger, broader, more cinematic sort mm-hmm. of, uh, sort of mm-hmm. way of doing things, you know. What brought you back? Uh, I, I believe it was WRNM actually. Really? Yeah. Um, our friend Matthew ran, yeah. uh, that short little game of WRNM for us and I was yeah. so, impressed with the elegant simplicity Mm -hmm. of it um i was at a point where i was not prepared to run something major um and i had a i had a story in mind Mm -hmm. uh, for a fantasy setting that wasn't my adventure game i I think i remember something we talked about that briefly um and the big complication was i think a lot of different people had a lot of different things going on in their lives Mm -hmm. so it was difficult for me to get to get a gaming group together yeah. And one of the things that was very attractive about WRNM was the fact that, as I previously mentioned in other shows, uh, the rules for it are free mm-hmm. and they're short mm-hmm. and they're super easy to learn. Yeah. And so um, I did a little bit of homebrewing with the system mm-hmm. uh, because I, I had a specific my, – my own homebrew uh, fantasy setting that mm-hmm. I was trying to make it fit and there were some lore reasons why – Certain things needed to be a certain way, so I had to write up some rules for mm-hmm. exactly how some 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 new things worked. But right. I mean, WRNM has like five rules, so it was pretty easy to homebrew six and seven. Right. Um, and then it was mostly just uh, finding a group to shop it out to. Right. Uh, I when I kind of wanted to use uh, new players mm-hmm. for it, introduce some new players into into role playing, especially because it was free and easy. Right. So. Uh, uh, I shopped it out to a couple people um, at first, and it almost backfired on me because there was some drama mm. around it um, with, you know, one person got invited to the group and another person didn't get invited to the group, and that that caused a blow up. And I was I, – I, I literally almost turned around and said, I'm never running another damn game in my life. Because drama, drama kills. This is – because if, if, if this is what – I like, I'm just trying to tell a damn story here, and I'm trying to do something good by inviting some friends to it. And if mm-hmm. this is – if this is, you know, if I'm going to get bit for it, then yeah, I'm exactly. walking away. Yeah. But uh, I found I found another group, a um, group of newbies, and uh, we ran it. Uh, and they thought it was great. I thought it was an unmitigated disaster. Interesting. But. Uh, Did they change your mind? Uh, they, see, they didn't really change my mind in that it was an unmitigated disaster. Okay, because, you still felt it was. Because I, I still, I still knew how i handled it mm-hmm. i knew how i had written it mm-hmm. uh and it 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 put in a stark contrast the fact that i i was starting to write things in very rigid means mm. of like this scene will play out like this yeah but you then fell you, back into the yeah the you, rails if you will right but then when you put players in control of things it never ever 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 because they're they're so ingenious you know he's a giant named conway kanye <laughs> <laughs> It's, it was an old saying, uh, uh, nothing's ever foolproof because fools are so ingenious. Correct. And, uh, that's, it's, that's like rule number one for running a game. Pretty much. Um, and so how I had written things and how I kind of foresaw scenes linking together, kind of like you in a very cinematic way, because I think I'd been playing in your game for a while. Yeah. And I'd kind of gotten used you know, to that. I, I'd gotten used to your storytelling style instead of using my own. Right. Your and own so voice. I think I was trying to tell my story with your voice is what ended up happening. I'm trying to stay away from doing that with my game, with the D and D because yep. I've really enjoyed your voice and the way you tell things, mm-hmm. and I'm trying to get nope, that's not me. Like, yep. So I get that. I get that. Uh, but it, it did. Uh, it did 
call into light a lot of things about how my storytelling style had changed. Um, and it, it was at least enough of a slap in the face for me that I sat back and reassessed and kind of used it as a learning experience and didn't just kind of say like, well, I've got, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years. I'm an expert at it. I've got nothing new to learn. So what did translate? What did come forward from, from what you knew in the past or how you did things in the past? Uh, I mean, obviously you learned. Yeah, there are definitely, um, I mean, some of the good things that came from it. Um, I, I still very much had a good handle on encounter design and, uh, pacing. Okay. And suspense and such like that. Like, right, right. the actual act of telling the story was not bad. Right. Like, all of that was absolutely, you know, like riding a bike. Right. But it was mostly that in my writing, I didn't leave options open for myself. I okay. said, this scene will bookend into this scene. Right. A will lead directly to B. Right. And then when the players didn't choose B, mm-hmm. I was thrown off because it's supposed to go to B now. And now I'm improving whole chunks of my story because I mean, A, A was executed beautifully. Right. It's just that when they didn't choose to do B, then I was left with a bundle of notes and having to improv everything after that point. So, and I get that. Like I can flat out tell you that there were times in, in my seven C game that you were in where that happened and I slowly got better at it. Mm -hmm. And, I know that uh, there's a question later that that came up on the Discord that we're going to go over um, about uh, the differences between um, role play heavy and dice heavy games. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know those kinds of systems. And I know certain players, and I'll, I'll straight up say it: um, uh, Chris is one of those players who likes a game with numbers mm-hmm. that is that has a more rigid rule system than, yeah. than 7C. And 7C is not a rigid rule system. Oh, yeah. Sean, Sean's the exact same way. Yeah. Sean's and the exact same you way. have to know your players for that. But I love Chris being in my games. Mm-hmm. He brings so much flavor to his characters that I love having him as a player. And that changes the way I run things. Mm-hmm. Because of that, I make the game more rigid, just a little. you know. And I, I try to adjust out some of the more role play elements of it because of him. And mm-hmm. I, I think that, that that was one of the things that I did pull forward from my previous games is like when I when I originally ran games like um, Palladium games, which are rules heavy, like so rules heavy. Oh, um, God. Almost, almost like you're a give, fog. You're giving me negative flashbacks here. I know. Uh, but you could easily peel back the covers of those games mm-hmm. and, and not worry about the random hit location tables sure. and not worry about, you know, some of the percentages and stuff like that um, and actually play the game a little more loose and a little more glory based or, or hero heroically based, you know, and Mm -hmm. that's kind of what I pulled forward with, um, with my style. And I, I'm hoping that that carries through into D and D and getting the game back up because I'm converting you guys from the previous system or two systems old, I want to say. Uh, yeah, because we were playing it in 3.5. Yeah. Um, into 5. Mm-hmm. And just to see how much that's going to change, because I think it's definitely going to make it lighter yeah. for everyone. Yeah. Um, and I think, I mean, I'm not going to say that the older you are as a gamer, the lighter the system you enjoy, because that's not true. But no. I think it comes down to your group. I yeah. think as the group gets more comfortable, there are there are certain things that they like to make sure that the, they're playing a certain way, mm-hmm. whether it's, hey, we do all of our combat dice heavy and we do all the rest of our stuff. You know, our social and stuff is all just social, you know, and that's that's a game style of a group. And sure. as a storyteller, we learn that. But I think as we be as we grow as storytellers and have these moments that we look back on and we go, that was shitty. We say that was shitty because. I didn't read this situation this way. Mm -hmm. I read it this way. I did wrong by my players. Right, right. And I think that's the bigger thing to pull out of my past is where I did wrong by my players. And take those those pieces, uh, that criticism that I got Mm -hmm. or even some of the praise that I got and listen to it carefully. Like um, I ran a – I know I ran a shitty uh, couple of games where 
I was totally wrong on the monsters. Like mm-hmm. I just was terribly wrong on it. And I look back on that and I'm like, eh, I never want to talk about that again. But I have to talk about it with myself to say, what well, can I do better? Oh, sure, sure, sure. You know, I, how I, can I learn better? I, I would actually say that's that's really kind of actually how this the this this podcast uh, podcast got started in mm-hmm. the first place was I think coming off of that that revelation uh, trying to run that WRM <clears throat> game mm-hmm. where I I said you know God I, I really have a lot to learn and I don't know if you remember or not but I sat down with you. Mm-hmm. And said, I want to talk storyteller stuff. We, yeah, I remember. And, and I said, cause I, I, I feel like I've gotten into a storyteller rut mm-hmm. and I feel like this happened and you seem to deal with this very well. So, you know, talk this out with me. What, what right. can I, what can I do to make this better and make this easier on mm-hmm. me to run and make more fun for my players and a lot less improv and such like that? I remember some of the conversation. I don't remember all of it. Um, cause it was over a couple of nights that we, we well, talked about this. It, it was, it was, and these are these are frequent discussions, which is why we have a podcast now. <laughs> it's true, it's true. But I want to say this was the the first time we talked was was over a year ago. Oh yeah, yeah. Easily. No, it was it was definitely a while ago. Well, keep in mind, like my brain, due to you know medical situations, w- rolls back now. Oh, it was just a little while ago, Rob. That was three years ago. Oh yeah, I guess it was. <laughs> you, you know, well, you know. <laughs> as you, you get older, the years start rolling by. It's, and it's that, true. That just happens. But I remember, I, think, yeah. I remember sitting down with you and having the discussion mm-hmm. about don't write it, just let it happen. Yeah. And as yeah. the as the moment rolls. Accept it. And that's, and that's changed a lot of my writing style. So like mm-hmm. I no longer write scenes anymore. Right. I write obstacles. Yes. And those obstacles are just kind of out there and yep. in place. And some of them might move depending on, you know, what, what's going on or yep. player actions or yep. villain actions behind the scenes or something like that. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I find writing, writing an obstacle course is a lot better than trying to write a movie mm-hmm. and then hoping that your players move through it. As you want to direct them, you know. Right. Um, but that was a direct result of our discussion of you. You helped me realize I was trying to write movie scenes. Right. Which and is – It's – Way too rigid. Right. It's way too rigid. It's good to write mm-hmm. the concept and the view, which you do a beautiful job with, mm-hmm. and then let the scene unfold. Yep. yep. You know, because uh, otherwise it's too rigid. The players just either won't accept it or it's not going to turn out the way you think it will. Exactly. Now, the other the other thing I did kind of want to talk about, um, too, is as time has gone by and you and I have both kind of drifted into and out of the DM seat mm-hmm. is that uh, we're kind of living in the golden age of role playing right now. No, I totally agree with that. Um, and like I, I saw an article the other day and I don't remember what it was a major publication. I want to say it was something even something like Forbes or something like that. Yeah, Forbes writes. It's amazing. Some of the stuff that they have in Forbes these days. But the title of the article was how to be a professional dungeon master. I saw that article. I didn't get a chance to read it. And, and that I, was Forbes. I didn't I didn't I didn't get to read it either. Um, but I, I did see it come across my uh, come across one of my one of my news feeds. Well, and I, I I didn't find that one again, but mm-hmm. I found the I want to say it was the New York one of the New York publications had one about a guy who's a professional DM. Oh yeah, and DMs five games a week. Oh my god, at four hundred and fifty dollars a game. What? Yeah, he does four hundred and fifty dollars a game. game? Five games a week. Five games a week. Four hundred and fifty dollars a game. Now, granted, that four hundred and fifty dollars gets them. For or gets him six hours of his time plus mm-hmm. prep plus everything. He manages it one hundred percent. Uh whether or not they're doing D D or some other system, he has everything they need. I, I'm I'm literally shocked speechless right now. Like I did not know you could pull in those types of figures. So in New York you could. Okay. I would say you could in New York. Okay. I, I you could probably do it in LA. Probably New York a lot better. Fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. I mean, okay. I mean I could easily see someone uh that's funny as heck when my dad's calling me in the middle of the show thanks dad (laughs) i'm going to decline you um so uh the the crux of his thing is that the players that he's finding are not rich they're not well to do's i mean they're Mm -hmm. they're i mean new york is an expensive place to live oh yeah yeah, it's expensive to store things Mm -hmm. and most of the people that he's playing with that he's getting this kind of money from are people who don't have the stuff to play oh and they want an right. experience they want a pay- place to play or they want someone to come to them 
and he's got both. Like he's, he's table, he'll set up he's got locations. Miniatures and exactly. Like if you and, if yeah. you want it, he's got it. He's got a storage unit full of oh, stuff wow. that he pays about a thousand dollars a month to maintain, oh, and it yeah, ain't that okay. big. But it's it's secure. He's got mm-hmm. all his books in there. He pulls out what he needs. A lot of his stuff is digital, but he produces these beautiful maps. He has people do music for him. Like it's a full production. That's that's really wild. But I mean, at that kind of money, you're gonna get it. Sure, 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 sure. But yeah. But I mean, but but, but uh, that's what that's exactly my point, though, is mm-hmm. that we're living in the age where that sort of thing is 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 possible. Doable. Yeah. Where you know there are enough new players coming to the hobby where I think it's no longer stigmatized. Where you know you're oh you're a nerd. The satanic panic is long since dead. Yeah, and you know, we're not that sort of thing. And we moved beyond the what was it? Uh, it was, it was probably like six years ago. The the person the people who put out the uh, they want a topless GM. You know, but they, yeah, did you hear about that one? Oh, no, I didn't. I was, Actually, what's <laughs> funny was she was professional. 100% uh-huh. they were like, nothing, nothing lewd or anything. It was for a guy's bachelor party. We went on topless gym. They hired her again, not topless. Right. But because they like, wanted you, to know the rest of the story. Can you continue telling exactly. the story? Like, they wanted part two. <laughs> wear whatever the hell you want, but we want you to be our DM. <laughs> yeah. They're like, you did an amazing job. We actually stared at your eyes. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. That's so, But that's amazing. good storytelling. But you're right. We are in that spot where this happens. Um, so I think, I think getting, getting back into the hobby, I think is a lot more forgiving nowadays because, uh, God, I hope so. <laughs> well, what I'm, so when I'm, when I was getting back in, my, my, my little weird, um, journey to fifth edition D D. right uh i legitimately did not even know that it existed for about the first year that it was out right right possibly longer i'm not sure um so about 30 episodes into the first season of critical role um this is when knocks in a box turned me on to the existence of, of critical role okay okay uh so i started watching it i knew they were playing D D, but that was literally all i i knew right um and so i they were talking about advantage and disadvantage and roll this check or that check. And I was like, these rules don't feel familiar. Like what edition of D and D are they even play? Is this, this isn't Pathfinder, is it? Cause it doesn't sound <laughs> familiar, you know? Yeah. And, uh, so we looked it up and it was, there was like, Oh, it's fifth edition. Oh, fifth edition came out. Exactly. Cause we had walked so far away from D and D after fourth had come yeah. out that I stopped paying attention to the brand. No, I'm with you. And I, I was playing other, like, I had moved completely over to White Wolf. Mm-hmm. Like, all of my games at that point were White Wolf. Uh, they had the whole Aeon verse. Mm-hmm. We were playing that at the time. 7 And C. so, yeah. uh, and at the time, um, I, I had decided I wanted to run an Elder Scrolls, mm-hmm. uh, game. Yeah, oh, yeah. So I what I was trying to do was I was actually trying to, uh, homebrew WNR and R M M to, accommodate the rules and lore of the Elder Scrolls universe. I, I, I remember this whole discussion uh-huh. and every time I was sitting there thinking, this is, sounds painful. Like this is, uh, you know, you're going to be working extra hard on this. Believe it or not, I was, I was getting real close to done. Really? Like it was, uh, but, but what really roped me into fifth edition was, uh, once we figured out that's what they were playing in critical role, mm-hmm. um, after watching a handful of those episodes, we said, yeah, this actually seems really, you know, Kind of cool. Mm-hmm. So we looked up YouTube videos because there are YouTube videos for anything you want to learn nowadays. Oh, God, Literally yes. anything you want to learn. I agree. And so we typed in like, you know, fifth edition D&D for beginners or something mm-hmm. like that. And there was like a dozen videos that showed up that right. were like, here is here is D&D fifth edition for dummies. Right. And started going over it. And by – I don't know, sheer coincidence, divine providence, call it whatever you want. The homebrew rules that I was making mm-hmm. was about 60% of D&D 5th edition. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, Some somebody switch. already did the work for me and yep. published it in a bunch of books. Yep. Sidestep, <laughs> continue. <laughs> Sidestep, continue. And I, we, we, we practically bought the books the next day. Yeah. Um, once yeah. we realized that it was exactly that style game system and that it was a lot simpler, a lot more freeform. Um, that's what roped me back into that. But, uh, on top of that though, I mean, the, the fact that we're living in an age where I experienced a new game system tangentially, Mm -hmm. wasn't even in the game. I watched it happen, was able to immediately pull up several videos that taught me how to play that. Yeah. And then you've also got other YouTubers out there like, uh, Matthew Colville. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, 
uh, XP to level three, which yep. is more of a comedy sketch thing. But no, but I still think but it's it, fine. But it's absolutely fine. It's instructional. Yeah. Um, there's, you know, Joe Cat's crap guides, which oh, I think are funny dude, as heck. I've showed that to so many people now. Um, and there's, there's a, a lot more serious, we'll like, put links sort of, the Discord. Uh, a lot, a lot more serious, like, uh, deep dive, uh, yeah. things like, uh, um, Taking 20 is a really Taking good Taking 20, is, I do is, remember is that. A yeah, really yeah. great channel. Yep. Um, he's got this great series he does called Kill Your Party With. And it's all sorts of great ways to use a very specific type of monster and kill your party with gnolls. <laughs> yeah. I <laughs> think just, I caught one of his. I'm not going to say which one. Uh, but it's, uh, it, but what I'm saying is that, and, and that's, I mean, that is literally scratching the surface. Right. Barely scratching the surface yeah. of all the If you the wanted media to be good before, you had to sit down with a good DM. Yeah. Or watch one at a convention. Yeah. And now it's everywhere. You right. can watch good, you can watch bad, you can get critiques you can watch a video about someone reviewing another dm and review the way they're reviewing right <laughs> no i mean i mean you're you're not wrong though so i think you know uh, getting getting into gaming getting back into gaming after a long hiatus especially if you're looking to brush up on your storyteller skills i mean i know a great podcast <laughs> for things like that but you know uh but there's but there's i mean probably hundreds of, of mm-hmm. different channels out there doing exactly this style of content that are you know that are there to support you right all right. the community about- is there it is closer it is better at hand um i still think that it's it feels still feels a little segregated it's little pockets but it's always been little pockets a little bit but little now bit. you can get to those pockets and watch them and connect with them exactly and discord's made ridiculously easier and and that's I mean that's not even including all the the actual play yeah uh, uh, media that's out there yeah um, I mean there's there's dozens of actual play uh, podcasts mm-hmm. there's you know uh, YouTube series Critical Role Adventure Zone I mean for, yeah. for every for every flavor there's there's from you know professional levels all the way down to just amateurs goofing off in front of a microphone yeah uh-huh. so no and, I agree with and, that and again statement. that's just for D and D. Yeah, no, no, I agree. I agree. Uh, sixth edition Shadowrun is coming out. Oh God! Uh, if it isn't already out, while I was up on my camping trip, um, I saw something mentioned about it vaguely online. Okay. Immediately was able to search YouTube, just like sixth edition store, uh, Shadowrun for beginners. Yep. Half hour video unboxing yep. the beginner set. Yep. Going over the rules changes from fifth to sixth. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, at this point, I mean, there's there's really no no better time to be getting back into it if you're if you're a storyteller that's uh, needing to dust your books off. Right, right. Um, so I guess the question is, do we want to keep this topic going, um, or do we want to start hitting some of these questions that have been dying on, on our mind right now slowly from our stuff? Because I I could go into the anxieties of getting back into this stuff but i think it's not going to be beneficial to me to getting back to D&D. no i you know i i think i think we talked about it too um, okay there's only there's looking at looking at our, our at our little note sheet here i think i think there's really only one thing that i would like to address sure and those are the words nuke and pave yeah yeah because that's always hit me as something because like it's you I, look at sometimes you look at old games like i'm i've been looking at my D D game mm-hmm. which is long long like i didn't realize how long that game has been running yep uh and there was a point where i I was i joined it in progress when i first met you yeah and what's funny is the players when i asked them like do you remember when sarah joined the game and they're like yeah right at the beginning i'm like no No. it was like a year plus into the game and they're like oh and you guys were playing pretty regularly at that time too so that was a a year into the game wasn't a few game sessions no no it was quite a bit and i I went through all the notes and i went through the sessions logs that i had and i was like holy god number one i did not take enough notes Mm -hmm. number two i was having to dig for memories Mm -hmm. like what what i remembered versus what i had believed you all knew and then at the end of it i was like we ended like what i called act two but we weren't at the end of act two Mm -hmm. we were probably a third of the way into act two and i was like crap do i continue from that point even though we're going to be 
the characters are going to be slightly different. How do I explain that? How do I work through that? Do I just scrap the whole idea and start a new game mm-hmm. that's totally different because I do have other ideas? And the nuke and pave seemed like a better option for me every time I got closer to it. And I've pulled away from it because my my players, including you, mm-hmm. like their characters, like the story, want to know what's going on with mm-hmm. that story. And so I'm going to move the story forward. I've got some options. And eventually, once I start the story, I'll bring those what happened and where my thoughts went through it um, up on the podcast here. But it has been a struggle to try and not nuke and pave. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I went through a little bit of that myself with my own homebrew setting. Mm-hmm. Uh, cause, uh, I very much like, uh, uh, I believe Techno Lich was talking about this on our Discord server too. Mm-hmm. Um, began writing my homebrew setting in high school. Yeah. And I was not good. Well, yeah, you learn. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, a lot of the stuff that, uh, I wrote into that was stuff that I thought was, you know, I, oh, I was subverting fantasy tropes and I, you know, and, and, and admittedly some of it was really good stuff. That's mm-hmm. where it's, those, those were the beginnings of my sort of gritty realism of like taking really tropey stuff and going, no, like, how does this actually work in the real world? You know, that's completely non-functional. Like no one would ever do that. Right. There's no reason for it. So it should work like this rather than like this. There's no bio- biological evolution reason for these things to be here. Right. Or to right. be well, like this. Or why would worship, why would people worship an outright evil god? Right. Like, you know, th- those sort of fantasy tropes don't make a lot of sense. Are they me. all goth? I mean. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, what, what purpose in a, in a real world situation would a god of destruction, you know, Have serve meaning. for things yeah. like that? So, I mean, there were good things that came out of it, mm-hmm. but at its, at its core, though, it was a <sighs> really generic fantasy setting with elves and dwarves and humans and the elves lived in the trees and the dwarves lived in the mountains and i mean those are good i mean they're tropey they're very Mm -hmm. Mm tolkien-esque and there was utterly nothing making them fun or unique from any other setting right and at that point why aren't you just playing an established setting right you know i mean i i've made the world that my D stuff is in is different mm-hmm. i've got or I, I mean i put this on the discord as oh, well yeah, yeah. <laughs> the orcs are noble they're they're night like knightly mm-hmm. like they're they're big strong creatures who are intelligent they're mm-hmm. probably the oldest race around next to the elves and when they met with the elves the elves are, are a little off put by someone possibly being having a a world that they've been involved in longer than the elves, maybe, mm-hmm. you know, and that they were better at making communication because the elves were all isolated, mm-hmm. you know, and it it made for a different setting, but not an undesirable one in the design. Sure. You know, I did shift the tropes a bit. Sure. So. And, there's, and, and, and to be clear, and I know we've said it before, there's nothing wrong with being tropey. No, no. Nothing wrong not with being all. tropey. But just – no, you know, acknowledge your tropes, I suppose. Yeah. You, you, know? you don't have to go nose deep into pulp and trope sure. and, and, and be the Dick Tracy story that's everyone knows the bad guy when he walks in the bar. Right, right. But, but I think what, what this overall experience at least taught me, um, mm-hmm. was I think the op- exact opposite story or exact opposite thing that, that, that maybe you learned. Um, I keep thinking back to, uh, one of my, my brother's favorite, uh, musicians, uh, Per Gessel of the band Rock Set. Oh, okay. And uh, in some interview, he said something to the effect of you've got to kill your babies. And that just just meaning that you can't be too attached to the thing you've created. I agree. You have to be willing to sometimes you need to nuke and pave. Mm-hmm. You need to be able to look at the thing you created and said, that was a that was good. That was bad. That was that was what it was. Yeah. But I need to move on. Yeah. I need to use that thing I just created as a stepping stone to create something bigger, something better, mm-hmm. something else. Yeah. And further explore, further learn, further push my own limits. I think that's a great way to put it. And I think I at a certain point I, I was I I spent a lot of time trying to rewrite my own setting. Mm-hmm. Kept failing, and it, and and I just I, I think it was about two years ago. I just looked at this big pile of notes that I had, and I just said, you know what? Nothing I wrote in high school is worth keeping. I got to mm. kill my babies, and I just threw it out. Yep. And that was that. And we've been playing Elder Scrolls ever since, and I think it's a good move for us. <laughs> I think you did great. I think you did great. So, so we do have some questions. We have some questions. I think we got about twelve minutes. 
Yeah. So let's hit the ones that because veteran was here last week, so I didn't want to answer his question. Sure. Um, but I think <laughs> between the two of us, I think we can answer this really quick. Uh, professional GMs, have you ever? Do you know anyone who has? No, and what and how? And we already went over that a little yeah, bit. But a little bit. What and how? First off, professional GMing could be in as much as like convention, and and I will say I have semi proed, but not like I wouldn't call it professional. I got paid for one gig that I did, but mm-hmm. it wasn't even a payment. Um, and I I've known people who've done it. Like for Gen Con, I know people who've done and not just gotten tickets to Gen Con. Sure, sure. Who sure. actually were up, were, did, ran a game at Gen Con, and it's different. Mm-hmm. Those kind of situations are different. And I've seen, I, I've heard of people who have done it in our area, but like, and I say Michigan in the general sense, but never, you know, it's it's been at conventions or related to people who are coming into town or something like that. So I would say it's a thing. Mm-hmm. But it's not a pervasive thing that I'm aware of in any way. See, this whole time, uh, I could have been making $450 a session and I've been being paid in Sour Patch Kids instead. Hey, it's what you asked for. It, it is actually legitimately what I asked for, though. Yeah, that's true. All right. Uh, Matt Systems out. to avoid for new storytellers and or new players. Um, two things. First one Two for you. main avenues. All right, two. Uh, rules heavy. Okay. Emotion heavy. I, I agree with both of those statements. I'm going to say for that, I'm going to tie them together sure. in one if I had to pick a system right now. Mm-hmm. If your friends sit down with a book that has the word paranoid on it and it's your first game, paranoia, paranoia, yeah, walk away. That what? is not a first game. Oh. That is not a first game with friends. That's like playing, you know what that is? That's playing, that's playing cutthroat settlers of Catan with people you've barely met that's, that you're supposed to be great friends with. That's accurate and... <laughs> But but paranoia. Paranoia is a great game, but you paranoia can't. Is a great but game. you but you have to know what you're getting into. That's true. That's true. That's Another true. one. I would you're not going to get your like classic done. Like if if you watched a bunch of Critical Role and said like I want to play the game, mm-hmm. d- you don't plop paranoia in front of somebody. It's a completely different thing. Yeah. Oh, I've, I lost the other game in my head. Keep, I'll keep going. I'm sorry. With, no, it's okay. I I had one other that uh, is going to kick me like without question because it was one that. Uh, Chris used to play and everyone who's ever I've never played it mm-hmm. but everyone who's ever played it was uh has told me that it's ruined friendships. Oh wow. And I'm trying to think of it off the top. I can't think of the name of it off the top of my head but it'll come to me. Uh the one that comes to mind for me to avoid mm-hmm. um though I, I know it's been out of print for ages now is uh Wraith. Oh yeah. White, in the White Wolf setting. Yeah. Um uh, very deeply emotional game. Like you, you die during character creation, mm-hmm. you know, because <laughs> you're playing a ghost. Yeah, and it just goes downhill from there. It's like um, the crow. <laughs> the, yeah, the, the it's, game. It's yeah, basically, it's it's that style of bleak and maybe a little, maybe a little too deep of waters to wade into for first time, especially players. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would stick to something rules light, and I would stick to something fun. I'm adventure-y. going to say, I'm going to say, be aware of of rules almost less yes that actually just came to mind because i was just thinking you know fate would probably suck for new players as well you you need to have some structure Mm -hmm. but not so much that it is cumbersome yes yes absolutely and it needs to be fun Mm -hmm. it just needs to be fun because they're not going to know what fun is yeah fate fate core is something i definitely want to talk about a lot next episode amber Amber, there you go. Don't play Amber with your friends because you will learn who everyone is in a painful, painful way. Oof, oof. I'm just that. That's what it was. Wow, that that hit me hard. Thank, you thank go. you with your godlike powers, friend of mine who is sitting behind his computer right now. I'm sure. <laughs> All right. Um, Techno Lich, have you? Uh, I have a friend going to Gen Con this year. Congratulations. Uh, and I'm sorry. Um, I've never been to a gaming convention. Uh, what are their thoughts about conventions, gaming versus home court gaming? I went to Gen Con last year. Mm-hmm. I played in three different game settings. Two of them were role playing game settings. Mm-hmm. Um, I will say one was amazing because it was a new system. Uh, like it was a D and D fifth edition and or uh, Pathfinder uh, story setting. And they, they just threw we 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 learned a new setting, okay, and with with a couple new races in it because they had rules for both. Sure, sure. And we played a dungeon crawl. Oh, okay. 
It was beautiful. The the, the storyteller did a great job. Seems it light, was spot seems on. Easy. It was yeah. fantastic. The other was Shadowrun, and it was probably the most horrific Shadowrun game I've ever been in. It was terrible. It was overpacked. It was in a crowded room. It stank. And the DM basically just railroaded us as hard as he possibly could under his literal top hat to get us through the worst story that I, I, I'm not going to say it's the worst story Oof. I've ever been in, but it was real bad. Oof. So I'd say you're, 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 the best thing I can say is that convention based gaming can be wonderful or terrible. Gen Con has both in spades. Um, I would, I would caution your friend. Specifically for Gen Con, and this is just a quick cautionary statement to, uh, if he, he probably does, if he has his tickets, he's, he's in on, on whatever he's doing. Uh, he's paid his dues and, uh, good luck. Um, unless he's got the table owned by him and his friends, he's going to sit with other people. Um, so that's something, but for, I would say for conventions and I've gamed at some conventions, it's different. It is very different because it is impersonal. It is not your friends that you're gaming with. It is people you may become friends with, though. But for the most part, it is it is your uh, society that you're gaming with. Mm -hmm. And that society is varied and yes. different and have very different opinions. And at the table, they are very different people than right. what your friends are sitting around the table with you that you game with weekly or biweekly. Yes. Yeah. So. I would consider them more like coworkers than friends at that point. Like you, you're, you're getting thrown together by circumstance, not because yeah. you, they're, they're your chosen gaming group. And that's always yeah. kind of a dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Veteran. Uh, so veteran yeah. asks, as long as a longtime fan of Knights at the dinner table, I've noticed a recurring theme. Many people write in thanking them for providing a touchstone that kept them feeling connected to gaming, even when they were not currently playing. I have similar feelings. Uh, many also expressed a desire uh, or recent experience returning to the table. I imagine Critical Role and other media could serve the same purpose. What are your touchstones? Hmm. Well, Critical Role definitely for me. Yeah. Um, I, I had really kind of almost faded away from gaming entirely except for what you were running. Yeah. And then Knox in the Box introduced me to Critical Role, and it's been a whirlwind sucking me back in ever since. I would say my touchstones, uh, at least for, for getting back to things, has always been fantasy movies in yeah. any, any settings. When a new fantasy yeah. movie comes out, it draws me just a little bit back to uh seven c oh i wish i could play a story like that exactly yeah, or yeah, i see yeah, something yeah, yeah. i'm like i know how that would play out i mm -hmm. know what rules are being played in that um you know a lot of the more recent uh pulpy stuff though that i've been seeing pulls me toward adventure and wanting to hear you mm -hmm. retell that kind of stuff so i would say those kind of things movies do it for me movies and, and shows do it for me yeah absolutely absolutely so a uh, couple good books, I think. Uh, the Dresden Files series, yeah, the, okay. uh, the the October Day series by Sean McGuire, yeah, um, things like that have really kind of captured my imagination. From I've also found that rereading books that you that you love, like I I love Snow Crash. Mm -hmm. I will reread it. Mm -hmm. I will reread Ready Player One. Um, you know, I will. Uh, I, I those types of books help me as well. Because I will, I will get the visuals in my mind again, and it will slowly pull me back in. Yep, you know, yep, absolutely. those kinds of things. Uh, so, our last question from Overwatch. Yes. Uh, if you are starting a new game that is not your stereotypical high fantasy, what tools and tactics do you use to communicate the setting to your new players that might not be genre savvy? Um, when I was doing Seventh C, I literally were giving people movies to to go off of or. Uh, or mythical stories, yeah. like children's yeah. stories, because it, it helps, because that's the setting. That's literally how they define the setting. I think for D&D, &D, you know, you, you kind of go back to Tolkien and you go to th those types of, of media. So I think media is always the good way for me to help people. Yeah, media is a great way of doing that. I remember when I was trying to organize the adventure game, uh, I literally told everybody, go watch Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow. That's perfect, yeah. And then just think of what a game would be like in that world. Mm-hmm. Did not take much. Did not take much. Absolutely. So, so I say, I say media is a good thing. And plus with YouTube, it's really easy. Oh, it's super easy. Yeah. Super easy. Barely you can just drop a couple YouTube links in an email. And yeah. you know, like I said, we're living in the golden age of gaming now. So yeah. it's, it's super easy to find. Sometimes stuff. I'll throw up pictures. I'll, I'll get mm -hmm. the art. Uh, cause a lot of the artists who do the books now do other art. Oh yeah. Sure. And you can just grab their art sure. offline, show it to people and be like, this is what I'm talking about. Digital age, man. So 
we had one more question, but I think it's going to segue into our next topic. Yeah, I, I, th- I think it, I think it absolutely is. It's pretty much our next show. So, uh, Matt Elf sent, uh, and this is a little bit back. This is more of a two person discussion than a question. So maybe for another time, if we're inclined to tackle it, which we are, we are class level based systems versus point based individual skill development systems, advantages and challenges to running and playing them. Well, funny enough, our next week's topic that kind of Sarah threw at me, which I didn't even realize we we're going to need, but mm-hmm. it worked out really well is systems and gameplay. Dice, levels, classes, role playing, combat. The whole yeah, thing. I mean, we, we talked a little bit about this in our first, uh, in our first show. We were talking about how, you know, the, the theme and the game system kind of go hand in hand, but I think we want to get a little grittier about, uh, actual mechanics, mm-hmm. how they play out how we like them what sort of game you know what sort of, of players fit well with them what don't and uh you know pros and cons of various systems like that so uh yeah uh so unfortunately mad elf you are going to have to wait till next week till next week you can find us on twitter at st underscore conclave or instagram same thing st underscore conclave um please take a look at our discord link if this is the first time listening uh you can find it on our twitter uh it'll give us your give the episodes and the other ones you can get to as well as joining us and we'd be glad to have you uh we'd also like to thank our patreon members knox in a box Ela may and our newest one dave Poland. thank dave. you so much for uh, helping uh, support the show yes you can support our show on patreon.com at storyteller conclave uh our intro music is uh, Beyond the Warriors by Gooey Frog. Our outro, which you're hearing now, is Only Our Footprints in the Sand by Midair Machine. You can find both these tracks and so many more on freemusicarchive.org. Uh, Podcast Detroit is where we record, and that's uh, podcastdetroit.com or Twitter at Podcast Detroit. Our lovely engineer is Kate. Uh, and we'd like to thank our families, uh, Vicky, Sean, thanks for everything. You did a great job, Sean, this weekend. And all of our friends who've sat at our gaming tables and made all these possible. Thank you. We love you.